Hey everyone, this is Joel and Noah from the Wealth to Sell podcast. This podcast is a conversation of our journey to financial health. We think working until 65 just ain't it, and just like you, we're trying to make sure that never happens. And if you're interested in letting us know what you're trying to do to achieve financial health and want to join us in our journeys, join the discussion on our Facebook at the Wealth is Health podcast. Let's tap in. All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Wealth is Health podcast. Joel and Noah, back again. Today we have something great for you. We're going to be talking about house hacking um, and kind of why you should be doing it, what's going on with that. Um, but before, like we did before, we're going to start out with a little, some updates on yes, what sir. we're doing right now and uh, how it's working. So I'm going to give it off to Noah for his first little updates. Hey, hey wait, time. why you got to call them little updates, though? I uh, got a big, big update, update bro. I got what's big your big updates. update? But matter of fact, now nah, I'm about to just give him a little one just because you said that. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I'm about to give him the main one because I was actually tight about this and we were talking about it yesterday. So my whole thing is um, my loan, like my mortgage loan is in like the underwriting process and everything right now. I'm actually supposed to close on May 27th, just so y'all know. Wait, what's the underwriting process for people that don't know? Damn, bro, you just going to Dang, you don't even know. That's crazy. <laughs> no, nah, that basically means that it's like... I'm messing. Yo, don't do me like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it basically means that... Um, what is it? Like, they're actually like... How do you even Ooh, explain They're writing it? under the... <laughs> yeah, like, they're writing under the... <laughs> nah, I guess it's like... They're actually finalizing the loan, like, making sure that you can truly qualify, verifying all your information, this, down the third. Because that's why it's like they're going through like your your bank statements and all that and making sure you really got their bread. You're not, I don't know, you're not acting up. Right. <laughs> you're actually still getting paid from your job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not trying to finesse. But yeah, so basically um, the underwriter was asking me for like, I don't know, she was just being hella annoying. I'll go like in depth later. But the the thing that was the most annoying to me was that um, since I'm, I'm self-employed, right, I have, like, a tax bill that's due, but the IRS was trying to bless, and they were like, yo, you only have to make quarterly payments, and I said, oh, say less, I got that all day, so, like, the first payment was due, like, April 15th, the other one was, like, June 15th, and then it was September, and then January of next year was when I would gonna be done with it and i was like word i could do that all day that's light but then like the underwriter was asking me about him was like yo so it says that this is your tax bill like can you prove to me that you made the payment and i said i can prove to you that i made the first payment because <laughs> that's what i paid so far since it's in quarterly installments or at least four installments or whatever and then my lender called me was like yo so i'm not even gonna hold you bro Basically, they're saying that <laughs> they're saying that if you don't make this payment in full for the full tax bill, ain't no loan, bitch. <laughs> ain't no house well, hacking, bitch. You can't do nothing. Because they were essentially saying that it counts against my DTI, which stands to debt to income ratio. So on their end, they were showing it as a debt that I owed. And the way that he was explaining it was that the quarterly bill that I had, they were trying to say that it's showing that I'm making that payment or I'm obligated to make that payment every single month for whatever Why? reason. Yeah, I, was, I don't understand that at all. I don't understand like that Like you're supposed to make the payment, the, <laughs> the payment to the IRS for your self-employed business every month? Yeah. But how is not not how is that possible for me? I, I don't I, know. I, I, I'm under the impression <laughs> that's that what I was trying quarter. to say. That's what I'm yeah. saying. It is every quarter, so I don't know why in their system. I guess maybe there's just like limited options in their system. That makes how to absolutely no that. sense, right? You need to upgrade or something. You need a software yeah. update. Yeah, how you want to do that? Update. But okay. yeah, I don't know. So I mean, at the end of the day, like the payment wasn't too crazy, but it was just annoying to me because of the fact that. Um, it's just the way that like I'm, I manage my finances. So it's like, even though I have like reserves and all that, I never actually use my reserves in order to, to make a payment that's coming in. Like I basically always front every single transaction that's coming through that I possibly can on credit cards. I, I keep my credit. reserves there. You said what? I said, I was going to say on credit cash back. Yes, sir. Let me get them reward points. <laughs> you already know what time it is. But yeah, and then I pay it off with the cash flow that I'm making. So, and the reason that I do that too, I mean, there's multiple reasons that I do it, but 
one of the main reasons was that I'm tracking my progress, like my growth, like relative to like how much I have in assets at any particular time. So that's why I don't like to come out of pocket and like go under and then have to try to build it back up. I'd rather just pay it off with cash flow and keep that same uh, dollar amount that's there and continue to build to it instead of ever taking it away. Unless I know that I'm taking a withdrawal like you did with um, your M1 account in order to put it specifically towards a business. Like that, that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that just kind of got me big frustrated because I basically put it all on a credit card, even though I have the money for it. And now I'm going to be struggling to, well, not struggling, but I'm going to have to be hustling to, to pay that back off going forward. And I also have to pay my closing costs for the loan, which is like $11,000. And what else? Like whatever upfront costs it like for that repairs. I need in order to get into the the property, yeah, and the repairs and all that stuff. So it I don't know, it's just kind of just piling on. But at the end of the day, like it really doesn't matter. It's more so just annoying. But I was gonna yeah. say too, the reason that I like doing it the way that I like managing my money the way that I do, because you had asked me too, like, oh, but if it's mad stressful, like then why do you keep doing it that way? I but was just, reason, yeah, but, but hold up. The reason I was asking you that is because I was like, if you just like gave him the money and you just focused on, I mean, yeah, I can't really even say it. Cause I was going to say, if you, if you just like front of the money from your reserves and you just were like, all right, I'm just going to make the money back up in my reserves and I can like kind of chill out. Then you wouldn't really have like the fire to, to pay this bill off like on time. Like, am I right about that? Yeah, that's what it is. Right. And it also prevents me from wanting to just like spend money unnecessarily because I know yeah, that it's true. like it's going to take me dumb long or it's going to take me however many hours from doing this side hustle or whatever to pay that back. And I don't want to do that. Therefore, I'm just not going to spend money unnecessarily. So, yeah, yeah so you that, operate under why. you operate well under high pressure then because you're literally putting you like a deadline on your head that you have to get. In a way, but it's funny Cause I deal with people who, who don't see it that way. I guess they just don't view it from that perspective. Because technically, I'm not actually under pressure. Like I could pay all of this off yeah, whenever I yeah. want it. Like it's called a transfer, my guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, <laughs> but other people, like they try to, I guess, prove something. Like nah, like the reason that I do this a certain way, or the reason that I I put myself in these positions is because I work well under fire, whatever. But they're actually making themselves broke in order to like give them that pressure in order to, to succeed or whatever. And it's funny because yeah, anyone sense. that like, basically anyone that's ever said that to me, they're, they're just not in the greatest financial position. So, yeah. <laughs> so I don't really see how it works for them, but I prefer to run it more so as like a simulation. Like I'm just pretending. Broke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm artificially broke. I actually like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just pretending that I'm really struggling. Like I'm going through and you can like see it like in my face, like, yo, I'm stressed <laughs> right now. But in reality, like this is literally nothing. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just annoying and that's it. But yeah, that, that's my yeah. update. All right. Well, I'm sure. You, I mean, I, I'll just, I'll just see what happens next, bro. I like, I like watching this whole thing with your buying your first property. It's oh, I was going to say that too. Yeah. Well, I was yeah, going to yeah, say man. before you go, um, before you go give your update. Nah, you could do that next week, bro. It's my time to shine. So hey, basically, right my... <laughs> 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 All right, say your update. Nah, I was going to say, like, maybe we wouldn't do, like, this part that I'm saying in podcast format, but definitely YouTube at least, like, actually kind of doing a walkthrough of my property next time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. should. Yeah. That could we might not be able to do, so. like, like, the full thing, but we can at least go through my unit and basically all the units look the same. And then y'all in the comments and all that can also leave your suggestions of like what you think I should do to repair the property or whatever. And I mm -hmm. want to know like what you think I should be doing while I'm living there. Cause I'm going to have roommates and then what you think that I should be doing to it. Like once I leave in terms of, Oh, should I be painting this? Should I be removing this flooring in order to, to put this type of flooring in or whatever the case is, just get like some uh, suggestions from y'all. So it's crazy is if we do that walkthrough soon, it'll be the first time I'm seeing the property too on the inside. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Just, just bring the camera. We're going to be straight. Of course. Just upload that to YouTube or whatever. All right, so my updates are, um, again, related to rental arbitrage. I've had no success. I don't know how much I talked about in the last podcast episode, but I had, like, basically some, not really, success looking on the MLS. So I looked for properties in Rhode Island. I'm kind of trying to focus on Newport, Warwick, 
not really Providence because Providence is not really that hot right now, to be honest. Not that hot, but just not not a move. Uh, East Greenwich and Narragansett. And I'm seeing it, it's hard because you want to reach out to the landlord. That's like the number one person to contact you want to reach out to, especially like a single family home because like they are the ones who are making the decision. So I'm having trouble reaching out to people like that. So I was recommended to go onto like a place like Facebook or Craigslist to look up properties. And I think I'm finding more success with that. I just reached out to someone today and asked them if I could, uh, just questions about the property um, because it looks super nice. It's in Narragansett. And they were saying like, it's going to be for a graduate student if a graduate student wants to live there. But I was like, nah, <laughs> like, I, what if we could make this right here instead of a graduate student? I'll give you a year, like your year long lease. That was hard to say your year long lease. And I'll just like take it over completely. So I'm going to wait for that response. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep looking. Uh, but this stuff, like I, I didn't realize, no, it really is like a, every day there's a new listing type thing. Like I didn't realize it was like that. Yeah. So I'm getting in the habit of checking uh, Facebook Marketplace. I'm not going to check the MLS, to be honest. I'm probably just going to stick with Facebook and Craigslist, at least for this first one. And then I'm going to try to meet up with these people. So took all the money out of my account, like Noah said. I also made um, a pretty good amount of money um, doing photography for graduation. And I'll just tell you how much. So I think right now I have, let me give you the exact number when I get in a second. But before I get it, um, I want to get to $10,000 just because 10000 I feel like it's like a comfortable place. If I get a house that's like 2000 or, or if I rent a place that's like 2500 at least, um, it's probably going to be 2500 for the security deposit too. That's already 5 k gone, and I still have to get furnishings for everything. So I'm, I'm looking for a two-bedroom, one-bath um, type thing. Pretty easy to furnish for me at least. And so that's that's kind of what I'm looking for. So right now I have $7,359 in this one account. And I probably have like an extra 150 200 coming into the account within the next week. But I need to get up to 3000 So over June I'm going to be making calls, doing all this stuff uh, to build capital, but also get some leads on some houses so I can actually start this uh, coming up. So yeah, I'm excited. F yeah, I'm excited for it. It's just like... It's just a pain to find these properties with and the housing market I know is going crazy. I just need to do when I get my first uh, meeting with someone. I'll really have updates then because I want to be able to know what I'm like saying wrong. I feel like I'm pretty good at pitching an idea to someone, but that's mostly because I feel like I'm a good speaker. But I don't know what questions like they're about to come to me with if it's something I haven't prepared for. So I kind of like had a list of, of things that I had ready. And I was like, uh, no, I was going to say, like, pretend you were, like, a, a homeowner and I was, like, trying to pitch the idea to you and, like, what well, you would think. But I don't know. I think I just got to get into the real position and, and speak to the person uh, and, and do all that type of stuff. I was going to you know say what's... I was gonna say that we could actually run that play because, um, <clears throat> like, I'm – well, I mean, I'm not personally going to be doing because I'm going to have property management or whatever. But, mm -hmm. yeah, we could definitely go through, like, the at least the regular – kind of tenant screening process to see like what people would be looking for and then mm -hmm. even like the other members of our mastermind group like jay and eli eli has already been like uh doing tenant screening and then jay is going to be doing it as well soon so they're kind of already in that mindset obviously it's going to be a little bit different because of your strategy like it's not going to be just a regular tenant situation but you could at least pull from there to yeah kinda, yeah and then yeah. also, it would just be us kind of getting in our mindset to be like, all right, so if someone, like, were to approach us like that, like, if you were to uh, approach one of us, like, what questions would we be? Or what would... Like we... yeah. Yeah, yeah, my fault. I couldn't even say yeah. it, but yeah. So, quite... yeah. so I, feel like, well, I feel like that would kind of work out. I think so, well. too. I think it would be work out better if we did it with everyone, too. But one of the things, too, I was thinking was um, there's, like, you have to kind of... It's, like, kind of a... No I don't, like, dress, like very nice most of the clothes i have is just then you say you be given. bummy bro you be out here just bummy dusty? all the time if oh, i can nah. if i can you gonna pull out, up I'll, there with the do rag this yeah i just got this shirt today in the slides just got it today <laughs> bro in the do yeah ex and see that's the thing like i i can't do that so i actually like had to allocate like a part of the, the money i'm getting uh to use for this to just buy clothes that looks like fairly decent 
so I can like impress the people I'm looking at, so they're not just gonna count me out immediately. Which you is annoying that I have expense? to do that. It's a bit. It is a business expense because I have to. I literally have to look the part, which is annoying. That's why you see like lawyers and stuff driving nice cars and their buildings, because you can't. It's just there is like a. a I don't know what is it, like a status type status symbol. symbol. Like, yeah, if I walk in there looking like, like I'm really ready, like I might even just carry like a a briefcase, a man. Just might as well. Oh yeah, my, <laughs> yeah. I said a suitcase. A suitcase. You about to go travel? <laughs> yeah, briefcase. <laughs> yeah, I'm moving in today, bro. Gotta, if I, carry I got a flight after this, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but if I carry like the the necessary stuff, people really will take me more seriously, which is annoying. But it's just like the psychological, like psychological aspect of it that i just have to get good at so yeah that's really it i went i got like a pair of like pants today actually but it's just annoying to me that i have to do all that and when i get big and you know more established just know i'm gonna, I'm gonna be bumming to the next one i'm gonna pull up this one's property be like i already have property so you want it or not i can't wait that's for that. that's how i am <laughs> always yeah I know. people probably yeah. hate it but i'm like i really don't care to be honest. exactly that's, that's yeah. what that's what we're going for so we can just do that whenever we want but that, that's my update. That's what I'm doing so far. Damn, I wasn't done with that topic, but that's cool. You're just going to end it. I mean, no, I mean, say say, say what you want to say. Yeah, so I was going to say about, like, the having to dress a certain way to, like, impress people and all that. Because, I'm like, the reason that that gets me so frustrated is I feel like people have be no good looking clothes? up. You said what? Dang. You so said you don't have No, I didn't even hear you. Right? You said what? Like, you don't have nice clothing, right? Like, you don't have anything nice, right? No, that's why. Nah, no, I'm playing. <laughs> 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 Try to test oh, me now. But yeah, I was gonna say because I feel like people just be looking up to people that be like extra flashy or like dripped out in a way, and it's like you know that like that man is broke, right? Like that. That's why <laughs> yeah. it bothers me because I'm like you're looking up to these people. And it's I like know. I know for a fact that some of these people that you're talking about are broke. Have no money. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. I even. Um, now nah, go ahead. I was just gonna say I think like specifically about like when people buy like hella expensive shoes or. I don't know, like, name brand everything, whatever, blah, blah, like, Gucci bag, whatever. It doesn't really, like, if I walked up to with a Gucci bag, I feel like it wouldn't really make a difference to the person. But for the most part, yeah, like, I, I know exactly what you mean. That that just, I feel like it's a natural thing in your head. If someone looks nice, they probably are in a good position. You're right, like, it, it really isn't the case. Yeah, so it's, it's talked about in the book, The Psychology of Money, as well, where he said that, I essentially... That okay. So... I think the way that he phrased it is basically wealth is the money that you don't see typically. So it's like if you see someone that's all dripped out or they have the biggest house and like the fanciest car or whatever, it's like you're looking at it as like, oh, they must be rich or they must actually be wealthy in order to actually afford that. But typically what happens is they just have a really high income and you need that type of income in order to be able to make those payments. But generally speaking and it's talked about in the millionaire next door as well like that's that's not where their actual wealth is like they might not actually have any wealth because all their money is tied up in these false assets or these actual like liabilities and all that because if someone has millions of dollars in like an index fund portfolio it's like you're not going to see that on them (laughs) because Mm -hmm. their money is tied up in assets or if they have like a massive amount of rental properties or whatever but That's more so like a general rule because there are people that, especially like nowadays, it's kind of this big movement of turning liabilities into assets. Like some guy on Instagram, CEO, Matty J. Um, He's he's the guy that does like the Turo course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, so he's big on turning liabilities into assets, so like buying cars, but then he'll be like renting them out on Turo. And I think he does a similar thing with like designer clothes and all that. So... I don't know. There, there's ways to do it, but yeah. Okay. That was all I, oh, I was also going to say you could look at Zillow too for oh, yeah. rental listings. I, I have been looking at Zillow. I usually yeah. look at Zillow, rent.com, the MLS, Facebook, Craigslist. Apartments.com. That's, that's com. it. I didn't look at apartments.com. Every once there. in a while, you'll see one that isn't on like the rest of the websites or whatever. So that's why I end up just yeah. looking at oh. all of them when I'm running. Like, there is another accounts. thing I want to s- like there's another thing I want to say too. It's it's that uh, the uh, there's this dude on YouTube called Airbnb Automated or I think that's what it's called, and he's just like nasty with it. He has like over 400 properties, but he takes advantage of like of apartment buildings as opposed to like single family or multifamily rentals, and it's like I just it'd be so much easier 
or there'd be so much more de- like options if I was able to be able to like if I could pitch it to a apartment manager or something like that instead of just pitching it to to you know, like a small company. I feel like I want to get like good at that too, but I know I can't do that if I have no experience before because it's so much harder to get a yes for something like that as opposed to like a speaking directly to a landlord. But it, he, it's just I think the the money is already in in apartments and stuff that's like basically already established, which is crazy. Cause I, and I'm sure an apartment owner just wants a consistent income too. So if you have consistent money right there, that's all, that's all you care about. It would depend, but like I know that chick um, Alexia Wright that does like the Airbnb courses and all that too, and she was featured on Earn Your Leisure's. Yeah, podcast. bro, her course is like two K though. And so is this dude, Airbnb Automated. Damn, you said that you're scared to invest in yourself? I'm not scared to invest in myself, That's bro, what bro. it sounds like. You K- sound kind of scary right now, bro. <laughs> That's crazy. But nah, the reason wanna... that I was even... The reason I was bringing it up was because she was saying that sometimes... And I'm not saying you should do this. I'm not saying anyone that's listening to this podcast should do it. But they they do say that sometimes, like especially with those bigger types of apartment complexes, complexes that they do kind of finesse. And they go like they go in there as if like they're actually going to be leasing it themselves. But then they end up actually doing essentially what you're doing or what your plan is to do. And I, I wonder if like some of the places that I've stayed at, if that was a situation there too, because sometimes they're like, "Yo, make sure you don't talk to anyone at the front desk. Like, <laughs> just go straight whoa, to the room." Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa! I did not know that. All right, yes, that's, see, that's that's like shady though, because you kind of want to get the landlord involved, because if anything happens or people see it coming in, it could turn badly for you eventually. But okay. I guess yeah, they so someone's actually told you that they're like, "Don't talk to them at the front desk. Just go up to the room." Um, I think so. I think so. it wasn't in the United States though. So, (laughs) (laughs) but that's a story for another day. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, house hacking. (laughs) Yeah, house hacking. All right. But yeah, if you want to like give them give them a little refresher on what that is. So yeah, house hacking is basically what we try to do, especially in our master mastermind group, to try to eliminate the housing expense entirely. So the way it works is, you usually buy uh, a duplex, a triplex. Uh, what is it? Fourplex. Any any multi unit home, multi multi family. Multi family. Yeah. Yeah, and the way it works is pretty simple. You're gonna have your tenants basically pay for your mortgage, um, due to the cost of whatever you give them for rent. So let's say your rent's three thousand dollars. You have a triplex, and you're renting out to the two other tenants for one thousand five hundred. You're gonna be making your entire mortgage just off the money that you're getting from them. There's other fees included too, like you're gonna have to deal with maintenance stuff and you know all this other the bills and fees. But for the most part, a lot a big part of your mortgage is gonna be paid for by the tenants who are living in your property. And this is big because housing expenses are one third of everyone's most like most of your money from your paycheck is usually going to housing, one third of it. So eliminating that expense kind of frees up a lot more money you can use to do other things, start business ventures, invest. And that's that's what we're here for, ultimately getting you to retire early. So that's what yeah. house hacking is. Uh, yeah, there's more, you know, other stuff too, but that's the general idea of why we want to house hack. So I was going to say too, and it's talked about in Set for Life a lot, where he's like, it's just kind of annoying that the general advice that's giving for people that are trying to save money or whatever is to cut out the, the little expenses like, I think people talk about, like, the iced coffee thing. Like, oh, if you didn't buy iced coffee every day and you save this money. But Set for Life, and this is why I kind of resonated uh, with it so much, was he was talking about instead of just, like, doing little things like that, like, why don't you focus on the actual bigger things? Like you said, like, housing, that's going to take up, like, typically, you said, what what was it, one, one third? third? Yeah. Yeah, one third. Um. Wait, how how do you explain it? One third of that's what I'm saying. Like, right? It's it's like one third of like the, your income, I guess. One third of your monthly income, living expense. Yeah, your living right? expenses basically whatever. It's a huge portion yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 of your expenses. Yeah. So if you exactly. just knock that out, you would have a lot more bread, and then you, you can go third. get your weak ass iced coffee, bro, if you really want. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you could probably even go out more a little, like if you wanted to, 
because you took care of the big thing. So I think like it's essentially like what is it? Housing, housing, your car, transportation. transportation. What's the third one? I think food. It's food and then uh, like nonsense, clothing. It just doesn't really matter after that. Honestly. Yeah, the, but the top three things is what you should really be focused on. So housing, the most important. Next, transportation, which we could talk about that too. We probably won't spend a whole episode on it, but we'll we'll discuss it real quick. And yeah. then food. But yeah, so that, that's right. kind of what you should really be working on. All the other stuff is kind of discretionary. So if you're being smart in these areas, then you'll be straight. But yeah, there's, so house hacking is essentially just like trying to hack your housing expense. So it doesn't even necessarily mean that you have to have your full mortgage covered or whatever. <clears throat> but as long as you're at least living cheaper than you would be if you were just uh, responsible for, uh, for paying that whole mortgage yourself or paying like the entire rent yourself then you're house hacking in some form. But you, some people also do it. You had mentioned it, I think, before the podcast, but getting, like, a single-family home, and if you have, like, an, an additional dwelling unit, or some people call it, like, a mother-in-law suite or whatever. So at least renting out one of those, or even buying a single-family home and renting out bedrooms. Like, whatever you need to do to knock your housing payment down, that, that's what's actually important. But, yeah, and we had actually... Actually, no, I need to share my screen for this. Hold up. Now I got to figure uh, out. While you're doing that, here. I'm going to say, what? like, the reason why house hacking is so good when you're first starting out is because you kind of already used to either living at your parents' house or you're if you're like me, you're in college and you're just used to living in a dorm. So nothing getting really changes education. when you go from here. Getting my education. <laughs> nothing really changes when you go from here to, like, uh, you know, the second floor of a triplex. Like, nothing really changes in terms of, like, your what you expect to be living in. If you're someone who's already living like by yourself in a nice apartment building and you have to go deal with tenants now, you might kind of your perspective might kind of change. It might be harder to get into house hacking. But the whole goal of house hacking is not to stay house hacking. It's just to eventually pay for your mortgage and then you can get out of that and you're still going to have a property that's going to give you money uh, at the end of each month. So we had talked about before that or even in the intro, we're saying we're not trying to retire by 65 like we're trying to retire way before then or may let me not even say retire but at least be financially independent way before then so we can live our lives how we want to um way earlier in life but the example that we gave y'all in the previous episode of how to become a millionaire through index funds and all that that was explaining how to do it in a way longer time frame and if y'all wanted to you could just play with the compound interest calculator yourself and just see like all right cool so how much money would i need to save and invest each week or each year or whatever um in order to get that whatever your target dollar amount so if, if it is a million whatever um how to get that earlier but if you just start uh decided to house hack then it would just be so much easier for you to build capital as long as you were actually saving and investing that money. So, in the example that I have up on the screen for the compound interest calculator, this would be essentially if your rent payment would be $1,300 a month. So that would end up totaling $15,600 on an annual basis. So if you had just saved that money and nothing else, you didn't contribute to a 401k or anything, all you did was just save the money from house hacking since you no longer have to pay that expense yourself. At a 10% interest rate, it would only take you 21 years to get to your first million. So <laughs> clearly that, that's a lot faster than the 45 years that we showed before with you saving, what was it, like $25 a week, right? Yeah, but, but that, that's huge though because even if, you, even if you did your normal job and you did whatever, if you got your normal job, and I know you maybe you wanted to use this analogy before, but even if you got your normal job at 22 after you got out of school, then you'd be you'd be you'd have your first million at 23. That's in uh, 43. My fault. 43. That's insane. 43. If you were just did this one thing and you still lived your life the same way, it's insane. Yeah, that's and not 1, even. 1,300. Like you're probably gonna be paying more than that too. Potentially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yes, that's like if you didn't even want to save any more money on top of it, that's if you didn't want to do anything extra in terms of um, try to investing to to beat that return through whatever means you have, like whether it's putting that money into a business or investing in potentially like individual stocks 
or buying more real estate and trying to beat that return. So that, that's literally if you basically just did the S and P and maybe put a little bit of tech to like ensure that ten percent. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just saying you could you could knock that down even quicker. But just so y'all know, to give the original example of the forty five years, I feel like this is important to see too. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's insane. So if you decided to leave that in the account, like <laughs> you just wanted to keep contributing and maybe retire off something else, um, at sixty five years old, you would actually end up with twelve million three hundred thirty six thousand four hundred and seven dollars at the age of sixty five through just uh the money that you were saving from not making that that rent payment. So might want to check it out. I'm not telling you what to do. <laughs> But I'm saying you might want to think about it. And by the way, um, it's going to be so much easier for you to qualify for like a primary residence loan, which is it's going to be like a way lower down payment requirement than if you had an investor loan um, and all that. So you'd want to essentially go for a multifamily property first and house hack that instead of getting into like a single family property that you would just be living in as, as your primary residence by yourself and just having this liability <laughs> unnecessarily and paying for it yourself, um, you're going to want to go the multifamily route first and then potentially scale down. So even if you want to get one multifamily and be like, all right, this is good enough, I'm just going to save um, that bread and then get a single family, it's so much easier to do it that way and a lot more or a lot less capital intensive versus you getting a single family and then trying to get into multifamily because once you go from a single to a multi even if you're living there in the property they're gonna know (laughs) that you're an investor like you're only doing this for investment purposes so therefore they're gonna count it as an investor loan and i uh from my understanding most investor loans you would have to put down i think it's 25 percent oh 25 yeah 20 maybe 25 percent probably depending on on the lender whereas especially if you're a first time home buyer you could potentially get in for uh get a multifamily property these days for 3% or the most common is like 3.5% if you're doing an FHA loan so an FHA loan uh essentially I actually I'm not even going to say the minimum credit score or anything <laughs> y'all can look it up or ask ask your lender but yes you would only have to put down 3.5% on the property so say it's like a three hundred thousand dollar property that's around nine grand down a little bit more than that but yeah you can get in significantly cheaper and also in your state they're potentially gonna have a lot of grants or just other home buyer assistance programs so you can use a site like Oh, I need to raise this thing, actually. Oh, it's recording, so I can't even raise it to show the site. But whatever. <laughs> I'll have it in the description anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So you can go to a, to a website like HUD.gov, right, and look at the local home buying programs. And it will go. It's, it's listed by state. So I'm just going to click on Rhode Island because that's where we're at. And then you would go to Assistance Programs. So, I mean, you could look at each one of these, but I'm going to click on Rhode Island Housing. You would obviously proceed to the website. And I thought I had it up already. I guess not. Just because I'm prepared. Wow. Right? Pretty ridiculous. <laughs> no messing. But yeah, so this is the one that I'm using right here. So essentially, it's a... Dang, that's how, happy, that's how happy you could be right there with your little family. Bro, what family? <laughs> <Right there>? oh. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, 10K DPA. So it stands for $10,000 Down Payment Assistance Program. So remember how I said that if it was a $300,000 property, you'd be putting down like a little bit more than nine grand. So essentially this Down Payment Assistance Program is covering that whole thing. Oh yeah, hold um, up, hold up, hold up, hold up. What? Storage full. Dang, oh, bro. why? Yeah, my camera died, so we're switching over to this boohoo quality, internet quality. So, I hope you like it. All right, you Dang, can continue. I actually one. want to see that after. <laughs> so I can roast you. But. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna just roast saying. You. That's crazy. All right, all right. But, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this is going to go through, like, some of the eligibility for the 
for this down payment assistance program. So it, you have to be a first time home buyer purchasing a one to four family home, uh, have a minimum credit score of at least 660, uh, meet obviously the income requirements and all that, take a home buyer education course. So if it's gonna be a multifamily, you have to take like the regular first time home buyers course and then also a like landlord course or whatever. I think you only have to pay for one of them and it's like $50 or something like that. The other one's free. But yeah, and then work with a participating lender. And they actually have like, if you just click on the link right there, it will show you the lenders that they work with. So yeah, you can get in for pretty low. There's other types of low down payment uh, mortgage products as well. So you can speak to your lender about that. Uh, some of them are also mentioned in this book, The House Hacking Strategy by Craig Curlop. Um, it's actually from Bigger Pockets Publishing. So, but you want to gem. mention that we have a lender too, right? Yes, sir. We do have a lender that y'all can mm -hmm. talk to, and he actually lends in multiple different states. He sent me a whole list. So, anyone that's watching this, if you want to work with the lender that I'm personally working with, and a lot of the people that are in our mastermind group are going to be working with, let us know for sure. Reach out to us whether it's on YouTube or Instagram or whatever the case is. We could bless, because our lender is, he's on point. He's really on point. And, by the way, <laughs> I really want to stress that because I worked with other lenders before I got to this property, and it was just the worst experience ever, bro. <laughs> Actually, let me talk about that real quick, because that was just so annoying. So, my... Dang, bro, you know what I forgot to do? What? I was going to talk about how you can make more money on the compound interest calculator, but I kind of just let you do your thing. You want to go back to it after? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. So I was going to say first, for someone like me, like, and I told y'all during the first episode, I don't really make a lot of money from my job alone. So I have to kind of side hustle in order to make what I need to make for right now. But because of that side hustle and all the tax deductions that I could take for it, it wasn't really showing that I was making the highest income so when i was going to speak with mortgage lenders and all that they were essentially not playing me but you could just tell that they didn't really know what they were doing because i'm sending them information and they see like how much money i have in assets and all that but they're really treating me like a broke boy and i'm like in terms of how much they're willing to lend me and i'm like bro this doesn't make any sense like because i feel like if you were at least educated on the process you would understand like you'd be able to look at the tax returns that I'm giving you and see how much I'm really making, but mm. what's actually going towards net profit at the end of the day. So I ended up actually schooling <laughs> or sunning actually <laughs> some lender that works for the bank that I'm currently working for right now. And I was like, yo, so you know, it's crazy. It's like, you could have just told me too that like when I go to, to file my taxes for this year to report a higher net profit amount, like, you could have just said that, right? Instead of giving me this such a low ball mortgage loan that I couldn't do nothing with. And essentially, the loan that he gave me is how much money I literally have right now. <laughs> That's no how much he was willing to lend me. Like, I don't even need you, my boy. Like, I might as well just do it myself <laughs> and get that cash out refi right after. But whatever. So, yeah, after talking to like three or four different lenders, I ended up finding the guy that I use now, and he's he's extremely proactive. He's very efficient. He gets back to you so quickly, and he's just willing to go above and beyond. So I've had phone calls with him. Like, I can call him with a question at, like, 9, 10 p.m. Like, it doesn't matter. He's willing call to right be now. there. Nah, chill. <laughs> oh, okay. He's willing to be there. Well, because I've already done that before, so that's the only reason why I'm saying nah. Like, I'm not just going to nah, do it okay, just okay. to do it. But, yeah, nah, I've done it sure before. Okay. He's even like kind of ran through like some of my some of my deal analysis with me to like let me know what he thinks about the property and all that as well. So yeah, I mean if you're looking for someone that's really gonna go above and beyond, I would I would talk to our guy. But another important thing to reference is well actually I don't know if you want to talk about the compound interest thing first. Yeah, let's talk about that right now and then go back to to your okay. thing. So if you could, okay, so. Like we use in this first example, imagine you saves up one thousand three hundred dollars every single month to instead of instead of spending on your housing, you you just saved it up, 
put in into VOO, uh, got a 10% return. What I'm kind of doing now is if you don't want to wait the 21 years, if you want to have it, let's say, in 10 years or, you know, seven years, five years. Why are you guys being impatient, like though? Because I'm trying to live my life. But I'm saying, like, my thing early. is, like, do you know how many people in the world would, like, All right, so when do you want to have... retire? <laughs> so when do you want to retire, No, Because I'm pretty sure it's not 65, right? <laughs> All right, bro. So, I'm trying to be <laughs> done by the end of next year. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> that's that's, that's what uh, level one financial independence is where I'm trying to be exactly. at. Exactly. So, but yeah, but yeah, it's it's because it's because we really want to get to that point pretty quick so we can kind of enjoy you know the, our, the lives that we have. So if you want to, if you instead like you can take another uh, route instead of saving up that money, you can save it up for maybe a, a little bit of time, but take out that money and then start a business uh, endeavor instead. That will, on on paper, mathematically make you more than the ten percent return you'd get. And after reading this book, wait, um, why are you just saying man, it like that though? Just on paper, like because, that's real life too. It, no, yeah, exactly. But I'm I'm saying like if someone goes out and they're like, okay, I'm gonna make this this I'm gonna do this business, but they haven't done the math out on paper and it ends up failing. Like you didn't have you didn't do the math, or if you do the mm-hmm. math and it's less than ten percent return. You might as well just scratch out that entire idea and move on to the next one. Yeah, do not so make a move. Paper, do not right. make a move for anything less than a ten percent return. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> that's my philosophy. I'm, I'm like, if no I could just get this one hundred percent passively, why would I do anything for There's you? There's so. no point. Shout yeah, out to so my job return. giving me them them weak ass raises. <laughs> 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 if you if you're not giving realize. me at least ten percent, why am I even trying, bro? There's yeah, no but point. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you want to make sure too that in the like, the endeavors you're trying to do have a market, have a purpose, and have good demand. So the returns we're looking for are so, like more like 200%, 300%, 400% returns. That's, if you, I mean, if you don't know, it's like four times, three times, two times the amount of money you're starting with. So if you took that money instead and can you change it? Let's just say you did a 300% oh interest rate. Oh, my gosh, bro. I'm going to do the 21 years, though. Back to the original example. Nah, not 21 years. I'll make it like 10. Let's say you started off at 22, right out of college, and you're going till 32. What and was let's say uh, 300. So you get 300% increase. Let's say you took that oh original 15. I know. You took that original <laughs> $15,000. And let's just say one year, you know, you made nothing because you put all the money into started out. But after a little while, you're seeing returns of maybe not 15000 All right, let's say it's like return. Because it has to be kind of like the base price, and then that base price is increasing at 300%. You know what I'm saying? Are you talking to me? Are you talking to Vera? Yeah, I'm talking to you, bro. I'm not, I'm not talking to me. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like imagine if your, your principal – actually grew at 300 percent, so you wouldn't be making i'm not 15, school, bro. i ain't got no principal i'm about to walk out of this room right <laughs> now, <bro. laughs> i'm about to walk out of this well, room i got right as now. a guidance counselor bro i don't know what to tell you no uh, okay okay it, <laughs> instead of doing instead of doing this can you take out the annual edition and then just put your current principal at fifteen thousand? Ah, uh, good you idea you know what i'm saying and then we can see what a 300% return would look like on an investment that you made 10 years ago. Is that what the answer is? Is that the answer right there? 16 million? Golly, bro. <laughs> hey. Oh, my. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's crazy. I'm just laughing because, I mean, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. This is taking you into say, consideration You say you're going to be laughing to the bank? Like that? Yeah, th- this is taking into consideration <laughs> that your your portfolio is is tripling every single year for ten years, just to make that clear. So, it, it I feel like it would be difficult to make your any product triple that much. But again, let's do. Why don't we do fifty percent? Why don't we do fifty percent? Because um, when I was listening to a podcast, the example that this specific person had given. Um, and it was actually a real estate podcast. He was like, it would be more efficient to start a business because you can compound your rate. Um, I mean, you can compound your money at a way higher rate um, than if you were to do it through real estate most of the time or rental real mm. estate at least. But the example that he gave was a uh, 50% interest rate. By the way, the, the reason I used um, 
300, 200 is because that's the number that they speak about in the in the Millionaire Fast Lane. Very okay. good book. And no, they so kind of just like talk about that. Why don't we just that. leave that then? No, 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 no. Don't leave it. I want to see what it would be. Well, the thing is, because you did 300 first, it's automatically going to make it look... It's going to be lower, mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. But still, it... it, it th- yeah. But I want to make it clear that that number is a number that you're getting because it's going to triple every single year. If you have a product that will triple every single year, then that will be what you get from your initial investment, which is insane. Even, even if... As you can see, like there's a lot of potential to be made because this is only 10 years. You'd easily be able yeah. to retire with $16 million if you had a product that was that good. And this is like another way you can get to financial independence, financial health. Because when you have a product and you have a product or service that's scaled so much that you can have these numbers, then you don't have to worry about retiring in 45 years. You can retire in 10. You just have to find the right product, basically, the right business model. Know that your numbers are matching up with, um, that they're real and they're able to, like, they're, it's possible. And once you know your numbers are possible, then you'll be good. Well, my whole thing is, it's like, why would you even want to retire that young? Like, what are you going to do with the rest of your wow. time, bro? I don't know, bro. <laughs> I hate when people say stuff like that to me. I'm like, are you dumb? Just say, people you say have that no to passion? You? <laughs> like, wow, I, you have nothing else you're interested in? You'd, you'd rather just be a slave for your whole life? <laughs> exactly. In a little cubicle, you'd rather do that? Yeah. You worried about your pension? Like, nah. <laughs> no no disrespect to all the, the hard people working out there. You know no, I mean? A little bit of disrespect. There should be a little disrespect. <laughs> Someone's asking you what you're about to do with your day. I just want you to have a little ambition is, is all I'm saying. You know what I mean? I have some aspirations. <laughs> That's yeah, it. But yeah, but, that's, that's that's it there. That's why I pulled the money on my account because I'm trying to get these crazy, crazy figures through this business. Wait, but I thought you said that that you sold because cause the market was down. Cause the correction, remember that? Bro, I did not <laughs> do anything. <laughs> so I actually hate you. Um, I hate you. I was about to not sell. I was about to not sell, and the day the, I was gonna not sell until I really needed the money in in June when I was about to start, and thankfully no one convinced me to sell right whoa, before. Whoa, 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 whoa! I didn't convince you, could, you to do nothing, yes, you did. my boy. Yes, you I did. I said, I said, this is the thought process that you should utilize, or that that I would utilize if I were gonna do it, but because it's like I you know, never know what happen because too. what if, what if like for example, yeah, the market has been down for the most part since you sold but what if that didn't happen because the market goes up the majority of the time i think it's like seven out of ten times or something like that or Mm -hmm. 70 percent of the time the market is going up so it's like you never really know um but yeah i don't don't know if you want to kind of explain the thought process the the thought process that you use in order to make uh that decision real quick yeah, so put, put uh, my people I was, on game, yo. I don't know why you're trying to be mad stingy with the information, bro. Bro, the game I had was just common sense. That was Whoa. all it was. Because <laughs> if you don't have that, <laughs> there's, there's some, yeah. there's a bigger problem. No, nah, okay. This is my thought process, though. Okay. We're we're long term investors, so we don't really care what happens in the market today. All right. Wait, I but kinda, what about I, my option trades? That's a little bit different. I'm just kidding. Even though those, you those are longer care. term too. Those are longer term. They're like exactly, two and a half years they're out, longer term, yeah. which is why you don't care until next. But you, your time to start caring will be a little bit sooner than if you're yes, investing long term. <laughs> so yes, sir. We don't care for anything that happens in the market. But once you need that money now, once things change, then you kind of just want to take the money out as fast as you can, kind of cut your losses regardless of what's happening, because the market can change at any time. It's e- it's a better idea to kind of say like, okay, I have. In my case, let's say six thousand seven hundred dollars coming out of the market, then be like, okay, I'm gonna take this money out in two months, and hopefully I will have six thousand seven hundred because you never know what you're gonna have. And for me personally, the fluctuation between like a few hundred dollars isn't really enough for me to say I'm just gonna keep it in and wait. It's just a few hundred dollars. It's not gonna kill me. So I just took the money out, and if it was, I I, I took it out on a profit. And uh, if if I needed any more money, I could just I'm gonna plan on working towards getting that. But it's better when you know for a fact you have this amount of money sitting in your bank account waiting to be used. Yes, sir. That makes sense. You might as well just lock like lock in the capital because if you're exactly. gonna be able to compound it at such a high interest rate, 
like you said, like the couple hundred dollars isn't really gonna mean that much at the Doesn't end of the matter. day. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, not at the end of the day, but at the end of that. At the end of the, the endeavor. Yeah. At the end of the decade. <laughs> exactly. Literally at the end of the decade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So, um, ideally, when you guys are looking for a house hack, like like I said at the beginning, um, essentially as long as you're hacking your housing expense, so you're paying less than you would have been beforehand then you're doing a great job but if you really want to do it i guess as a or extremely efficiently let me not say as efficiently as possible because there could be better ways that i'm not thinking about right now but if you want to at least be like fairly efficient at it you want to make sure that the property at least works as a rental as well so some of the little like tools and kind of rules of thumb that that you guys can use when you're looking at a property is that um or the one percent rule for example Yes, sir. So right now, you said what? I said yes, sir. So right now, I'm on Trulia. Um, you could use essentially any of these types of websites for it. Trulia, Zillow. You could talk to a realtor and actually get the MLS, which would be the most efficient thing to do. But you might not want to do that unless you're actually ready and you're like really kind of looking for a property like right now, right now. Or if you just have like realtor friends that could bless you. That, that's another. That's another thing. If you don't, join a group. Yes, sir. Join our group. Join our group, too. Yep. He might not bless you you right away, though. (laughs) Yeah, you might have to earn it a little bit. But uh, So let me explain the 1% rule really quickly. So right now, for the record, for for y'all that can't see the video, I'm looking at uh, multifamily properties in Providence. Hold on, hold on, hold on. on. For anyone that can't see the video, go go look at the YouTube. Look at the video real quick. Yeah, go on YouTube. Like, subscribe. Like and subscribe. Turn the notification bell on. You dig. That's what I'm saying. So. All right. Oh, and comment, by the way. Dang, I didn't get a cosign for that one. No, nah, comment, bro. Comment. <laughs> comment. Comment. I was going to I can't get it's an ad lib at least. Bro, it's because like, I never. I look at the comments, but for some reason, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to reply to this. Dang, That's bro. That's you. No, nah, because I'm waiting for nah, your that response. Is me. That like, is me. Your waiting right. response. Like, I'm, I'm waiting for that. I missed like two days worth of comments. It's okay. I saw him today. I finally saw him today. But yeah, so okay. so right now I have multifamily properties in Providence, Rhode Island on the screen. So essentially what you'd want to do is make sure that the property could at least rent for 1% of the purchase price. That is a general uh, rule of thumb. So to give an example... So this property right here, right, is $325,000. So the 1% rule is stating that this property needs to rent out for at least, what is it, $3,250 a month Mm. in order to, in order for you to even really do like a deep dive analysis to see if this is actually a good deal. So something that you guys could use is a tool like Rentometer, which I'm going to show in one second but you would essentially take the address of the property. So the property that I have up here right now, um, that's $325,000. The reason that it caught my eye is because I saw that it was nine bedrooms and three bathrooms. And you can clearly see from the picture that it looks like a multifamily property. Obviously we can go in, like we can click on it and go through all the pictures to make sure that it really is like all three bed, one bath units. I'm not gonna do that right now because we're just showing a quick example. Um, But that was something that caught my eye. So, because of that, that from what I know of the area, it, it seems like that's that's definitely going to meet the 1% rule. I don't know if it's going to sell for that price <laughs> in this market, but for the initial kind of analysis, really quickly, you would take the address of the property as long as accounting for the bedrooms in the bathroom and plug it into rentometer. So, you plug in the address, obviously, on the address bar. I always leave the rent uh, section blank and I put in the bedroom so it looks like they're going to be all three bed, one bath units. So you would just hit analyze address and then it shows you right here uh, the average rent, the median rent. If you have Rentometer Pro, which I do, um, you can actually click on the pro report and it's going to show you um, like actual properties that were rented out or actual units that were rented out so you can kind of compare to see the ones closer to your actual location that that you input 
um, to see if they're actually qualifying for for these types of rents. But yeah, so for y'all that are that are just listening, the average rent in the property that I had on the screen was thirteen oh two, so one thousand three hundred and two dollars. So I'm just gonna say thirteen hundred, right? So since I'm assuming that it's all three bed, one bath units, that would be three units. You would take that thirteen hundred and you will multiply it by three. Uh, so what is that? Thirty nine hundred. Three thousand nine hundred six. Yeah. Dan, you trying to be all extra technical? It's six, man. It's six. <laughs> but yeah, so well, the like the only reason why I, why I wouldn't input that is because it's like you're not gonna see a rental listing for thirteen oh two. Like it's it's gonna be thirteen hundred or it's probably gonna be like thirteen fifty or whatever. Um, so I don't get like super super technical with it. But yeah, so that'd be thirty nine hundred a month. So that's essentially saying that you may be able to pay up to three hundred and ninety thousand for this property and potentially have it um, as a good deal. You would have to really do the full analysis. So in order to understand how you would do that, um, I'll leave a link for the course that I took on rental property investing in the description. You could also utilize the house hacking strategy, which I discussed before. Um, there's plenty of other books on rental property investing, especially through bigger pockets. Like they have a book literally called like the book on rental property investing. So I've definitely checked that out um, because there's going to be a bunch of other expenses that you're going to need to to accommodate for. Like, for example, repairs and maintenance. Uh, what's the other one? Vacancy expenses, because your property is not going to be rented out 100 percent of the time. Also capital expenditures that's typically like the bigger types of repairs for the property like for example if you need to replace the roof and stuff like that like you want to be saving for all of these things each month so that when something comes up it's not really a big deal like if it takes you a little while to get one of your units rented out that's fine because you were saving for that this whole time so it's a, it's always important to have those reserves as well so it's not just a mortgage payment alone and then also when you're doing your analysis, you also should, what's it called? You should also uh, include property management in your analysis as well. So to give the range actually for all of these things. So people, the general kind of rule that people use for the most part, I think, is they put away 5% of the gross rent for vacancies, 5% for repairs and maintenance, um, around t like I think 8 to 10% for CapEx capital expenditures and then seven to ten percent as a property management fee so like basically off rip that's that's almost like 30 percent of the gross rent that's going away like not even including the mortgage so it's not as simple as just oh well it's renting for this much and the mortgage is only this much if you want to run it truly as a business and if you want to be in this game <laughs> for a long time instead of just a good time shout out to drake then you might want to save for those reserves as well because that's how you make sure you're really not going to get knocked out of the game. And that's how you also prepare for when people like to say things about how real estate isn't worth it because of like all the potential uh, repairs and maintenance and like issues that you're going to have. As long as you are preparing for that and you included that in your analysis and you're actually putting these reserves away, you're probably going to be fine, bro. <laughs> you're going to make it through. So... Yeah. Oh, one more thing as well. So if you want to get, if you go on Trulia um, and you actually click on the property, it will kind of show you like your estimated mortgage payment and all that. So I'll scroll down. Oh, it also shows like the property taxes and everything. So you can include that in your analysis as well. But it will show you, like I said, like your estimated mortgage payment and you can adjust it. So it's naturally going to have 20% as the general kind of down payment amount that you would put so if you're only going to put three and a half percent down you would just click that in here so it's going to show you yeah you can play with the home price That's looking nice right there right so you can adjust it how you need to like if you're gonna if you might have to pay more for it or whatever you can input it in here it's going to adjust for the down payment and then it will have kind of like a default interest rate right there so a way that you can get a little bit more precise with the interest rate is obviously you can speak to a lender, but also there's a website called Mortgage News Daily that I have up on the screen right now. 
and that's going to show you like the daily kind of mortgage rates. So I actually got uh, locked into my rate at, I believe it was like 3.125. So essentially like basically 3.13. So it was probably around May 12th that I actually received the document with the, the interest rate locked in. So that can change depending on your credit situation and like your, your debt to income and like all that other stuff as well. But yeah, I mean, in terms of like the interest rate portion, now is is a pretty good time to buy because of the fact that, and we discussed it before, but essentially inflation is typically around two to three percent a year. So if my interest rate is basically three percent, then I mean, I, I'm damn near not even really. <laughs> I'm basically sure. almost getting this loan for free because inflation's kind of eating up that cost anyways. So. Yeah, it's just it's just another way to to look at it. But I think that's it, right? Oh, I mean, also, I wouldn't even take these home insurance things um as seriously when it comes to uh the mortgage payment and all that because I know for example on my property, my home insurance is let me see. It might be like double that. So on the screen it has it at $75. Well, Mine is maybe almost double that, but mine right now is like $134, and I think it's specifically because it's a multifamily property, so it's just like more to insure. Um, that makes sense. But yeah, so th those types of numbers aren't really going to be exact, but the principal and interest and the property taxes are probably going to be a little bit more closer to like an actual realistic number. I'm not sure about the mortgage insurance, but a lot of this stuff, you're not really going to know until you actually speak to a lender. Um, and they can give you the rundown on the property and show you an example of um, what you could be paying. That That's a lot more exact than Trulia. But th this is kind of a decent benchmark when you're first starting out and you're first trying to just look at deals and practice. So, yeah, I mean, that that's basically all I have. Okay. I mean, that's, that's basically all I have, too. I think right. um, so. So yeah, okay, that that was great. Yeah, next so next week we're gonna be talking about um, the same thing, a little bit more in depth, some personal experiences yeah, yeah, from yeah, Noah. Yeah. yeah, so Noah and we have uh, a guest, uh, someone who actually bought a property property in Providence. His name East is Jason. Providence. To, East Providence, my fault. He had to deal with an eviction, so we're gonna talk about uh, that and kind of you know the why it's not all it's cracked up to be sometimes, but why it's still definitely a worthwhile investment. Uh, let us know in the comments. Wait, 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 below. hold on. I wouldn't say that it's not what is cracked up to be i would say more so that just like um there's this like phrase in economics that they use that it's like there's no such thing as a free lunch so it's basically just like it's not just gonna be sweet 100 percent of the time like you know what i mean mm. if it was just extremely easy like that then obviously like people say like oh anyone would do it or whatever <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, but it's like yeah. yeah there is gonna be some work you're gonna run into problems so we want to make sure that when we're talking to you guys about these about like these types of topics we're not just out here capping and making it seem like it's just all the way good like no i'm actually frustrated with like a lot of things through this process and i want to make sure that y'all know that but at the end of the day i'm continuing to talk about it because i know that like this is just the more efficient way to live life mm -hmm. and i'm reaping a lot of the benefit uh, a lot of the benefits from it already so imagine what it's going to be like later once i'm like truly financially independent so that's why we're saying like you guys are are or we're basically documenting our entire journey. We really the entire are. process. Yeah, the, the good and the bad from ground zero you. right here for me exactly. at least. Oh, wait. <laughs> I didn't mean to say exactly that. <laughs> <Dang. My> <laughs> I was on like autopilot like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is true though. It is true cuz I haven't like started as as many endeavors or at least built up as much money yet this way. But yeah, so that's even dope for like for you though, because like you get to see like no, it, it is gonna be worth it. Like especially when we mm -hmm. go back to the compound interest calculator. But yep. yeah, you're definitely gonna be facing struggles, and you're gonna have to push through. This is really what you want. So yeah. Yeah. So so let us know um, what you think Noah should paint his the inside of his his <laughs> triplex, because he's gonna have to do a little bit of painting when he first gets in there. Yeah. And let us know too. Do you want to to get a duplex, triplex, fourplex? Um, let me say this too, actually, enough. yeah, about the multifamily thing. So the general rule that is that um, if you're getting a duplex, you're probably going to have the tenant pay like 
the majority of your expenses for you. But you're still going to have to come up with a little bread. If you get a triplex, you'll probably be living for free. And if you get a fourplex, then you're probably actually going to be cash flowing while living there. There are ways to get like more creative with it. Like, for example, I'm getting, I'm getting a triplex. But while I'm living there, I plan on renting out two rooms. So that's why I would actually cash flow in the property. But, yeah. If you didn't have a property manager there, I'm guessing you would still be cash flow positive even without the tenants? Or we'd just be living for free. I'd have to uh, to run the analysis. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's that's it. That's all we have for today's <laughs> episode. Yeah, because that, that's so much right there. That's all we have for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. If you stayed this far, again, like, subscribe, uh, leave a review anywhere. And like we said before, we're gonna have all these um, all these different resources linked below, so you can get every single one of them. Thank you again. We'll see you on the next week's episode. Yes. Yeah.